A story of a seventh generation farming family working a stunning property on the east coast of Tasmania. But running a farm is a balancing act. Whether it's food or fibre, there are critical choices about what crops to grow or which animals to keep. And central to the equation is the land. What's its best use? How's it to be managed? Chris Clark reports from historic Bangor. The Brim Creek Show traces its origins back to 1886. And although it's a tiny one-day affair, it's among the most popular shows in southern Tasmania. In the wool tent, Matt Dunbabin's laying out the winning ribbons. The Brim Creek Show might be small, but it's still determinedly an agricultural show. It gets people from the city out into the bush and they get to see stuff they wouldn't normally see like fleeces and, and shearing and as well as all the other produce and, and stalls around the ground and displays in the arena. Matt Dunbabin's the sixth generation of Dunbabins to farm in this region. Fine wool's their main game. So naturally they have a fleece in the competition at Brim Creek for wool with a fibre diameter under 17 microns. This is a fleece off one of our one-year-old sheep that we shore last year and it took our first prize in its section, which is pleasing. It's particularly fine and for that micron it's uh, quite a heavy fleece, which is important when they're showing fleeces, weight counts for a lot, so that's great. Just as the distractions of the Brim Creek show have changed over its 150-year history, so the Dunbabins, like everyone else in the fine wool business, have had to change too. That's one of our hoggets that got first. Oh, is that a in the finer than 17 category. What Matt's father, Tom Dunbabin, produced two decades ago is no longer the benchmark. And the difference is largely down to technology. Fibre iron has decreased and secondly, we've the weight of wool per sheep's increased. And that's pretty much entirely been as a result of being able to use objective breeding techniques and also wool measurement. So what's happening now is that the breeding is based on not just the feel of the wool and the look of the sheep, but also the physical measurement. And that's made a huge amount of difference. Producing a winning fleece is a process of many stages, but selecting the best animals is the key. So back in November last year, Matt Dunbabin began the annual task of selecting which rams to keep and which to discard. These are from our one year old rams. We get uh, measurements on their fleeces. So we're taking a mid-side sample, which is what I took out of there. We can send that off to the lab and get a fibre diameter test and we also measure the weight of each fleece before it comes onto the table. Do the whole drop of rams and that'll help us uh, get information about their genetics which will inform our selection and breeding decisions. There are more than a hundred rams to be shorn and they'll only keep a dozen or so. Since producing fine wool is the aim, analysis of the ram's first fleece is a good starting point. They've all been born in one mob and they're all run in one mob. So the idea is everything we see here will be due to genetics. And part of the reason for the amount of measurements that we take and the analysis we get done is to try and tease out what's environment and what's genetics. Fibre diameter is important, but so is the length of the fibres. In days gone by, assessment was entirely by hand and eye. And they still give some very obvious clues if you know what you're looking for. Last one was a nice fleece, whereas this one here is much shorter. It's obviously going to weigh a lot less. So this is from an animal, you know, without putting the mockers on it, just by looking at its fleece on the table, but you can tell a bit about it that it's probably not going to make the cut. Fine wool must also be strong enough for processing. So staple strength, the strength of the fibres, is critical too. Yep, so that's a, that wool was tender. That animal's had some challenge at some time. and So staple strength is important in this fibre diameter of wool. It's important to have sound wool, so it won't get very good points for staple strength, that one. The analysis isn't confined to the fleece. Matt Dunbabin needs to know as much as he can about which animals are producing the best results. Okay. This will make him jump. 
so he wants to know the full pedigree of all the breeding stock. In this case, sampling stud rams, clipping a small piece from the ear and gathering a tiny amount of blood which will go off to the lab too. Well, in our breeding program, you get a lot better information about the, genetic, the genetics of an animal if you know who his relations are, who was his father, who was his mother, and more importantly, who his half-brothers and sisters are. So in our stud flock, all our rams and ewes and the lambs, we take a blood sample out, and with that DNA, the, the laboratory can tell us who the father and mother of each of our new lambs is and who their brothers and sisters are. For decades, the Dunbabins sourced their rams from other studs in Tasmania. But since starting their own stud, they've seen some big improvements. Since we've started breeding our own rams in the last six or seven years, we've dropped our micron of all our sheep and we've increased our fleece weights and there's plenty of room to move. We're not gonna to bottom out there. So yeah, um, I think we can keep on that track. The story of how the Dunbabins have used this land is a mixture of innovation and necessity. Most of their 6,500 hectares is native bush. Perfect for fine wool, but it limits their more intensive prime lamb and cattle ventures. And they've devoted a third of the property to conservation reserves, which allow for limited or no grazing. It's also a story that begins with John Dunbabin, a convict made good. John moved down here. Um, he was a dentured convict and he worked for Henry Bilton, who had land in Brent Creek, and he came down in 1840-odd, and after he got his pardon, he actually bought Bilton's property. Tom Dunbabin is a fifth-generation Dunbabin and a chronicler of the family history. He's written a book covering the years when his forebears farmed Mariah Island, just a short boat ride from the mainland. Mariah Island's interesting because it's, we've had that family connection, but for me even, it's part of the geography of, of where I live, because it's so obvious from, from Bangor, for me probably virtually from anywhere, you can see the island. During Tom Dunbabin's stewardship of Bangor, the family won a couple of prestigious land management awards. So I wanted to know what he thought of the way his great-grandfather farmed Mariah Island nearly 150 years ago. From their perspective, it was a success. They ran a successful business. I suspect that they were pretty conservative in their stocking and their grazing, so they would have managed it overall fairly conservatively, I suspect. The early European history of Mariah Island saw sealers and whalers give way to convicts, then farmers. They came here in 1869 and farmed here for seven years, and this was one of the major buildings that they used. Tom Dunbabin used family letters to build a picture of farming life here. On a couple of occasions there were references to people who came to the island and said, how oh, there was too much grass here, they should have more sheep. Well, my perspective is that, you know, too much grass has never caused me to lose any sleep, but a lack of it um, is an absolute nightmare. The Dunbabins' stay on Mariah Island was brief, but the family farming tradition went from strength to strength on the mainland. It's been rewarding and interesting to be able to farm the similar sort of area, but in a much more productive sense than ancestors have done. Um, that's been a bit of a challenge for various enterprises that we've undertaken over the years. Some of those challenges are self-imposed, like limiting grazing and protecting country and conservation reserves. Geography influences some of that, but it's a view that sees the whole as land management, not conservation versus farming. You must have a successful business model, business operation to, to maintain the rest of the farm. So unless the business model succeeds, it's not going to succeed no matter what your values might be. So it's not an either or thing, it's the two are together. Farming Bangor is now the daily responsibility of Matt and Vanessa Dunbabin. Their three children are part of the seventh generation of Dunbabins in Tasmania, and they must make their own way too. Fine wool remains the backbone of the enterprise, since most of the property is ideally suited to the purpose. 
but elsewhere there are big changes afoot. The strategy is to move to more intensive land use where possible. These earthworks will create a dam to hold 1,500 megalitres of runoff. Initially, they'll irrigate a couple of hundred hectares to grow a rotation of different crops. It's basically a way of improving the productivity of the property. So currently we're uh, dry land grazing and there's areas of uh, better ground that have the capacity to be irrigated and produce crops and that'll allow us to lift the productivity of those areas and, and just intensify that part of the farm. It doesn't stop there. They're also adding horticulture to the mix. They've planted a small vineyard and plan to produce their own label wines. This is about the most intensifying thing we could do with a relatively small piece of land. It's in a great location, it's got a good aspect, good soil for, for growing vines and it's near to the highway here, a lot of passing traffic, so our vision is we'd have a cellar door. It offers the prospect of a slightly different experience to the normal life of most primary producers. Unlike growing fine wool or most other agricultural products where you grow the product and it disappears out the door, you know, we'll get to deal with the end buyer, the end consumer of our product, which will be something new and, and something enjoyable for us. Wool is likely to remain the backbone of the operation at Bangor for as long as prices hold. And that means the quest for quality must continue. These are the young rams which were shorn last November. Months later, with summer come and gone, it's time to decide which will stay and which will go. A sheep that grows more finer wool is a more profitable sheep. He doesn't eat any more, he's still going to have to shear him once, he takes just as much to run, uh, and a large part of that's controlled by genetics. So it's crucial for us to try and keep our genetics improving. So Matt Dunbabin now has the numbers in front of him. Fibre diameter, fleece weight. He'll also look for any physical defects in the animals before making a decision. So number 60 has got... His figures are very good. Very fine and a moderate amount of fleece weight. He's one of the better ones. If there's, if there's no visual faults in him, yeah. he's in for sure. So, Since they began breeding their own rams, they've increased their fleece weight and reduced their fibre diameter. And there's always room for improvement. Our adult sheep now are at about 17 microns. Over a 10 year period, we'd be able to drop our micron by probably one and add a kilogram or so onto our fleece weight. When you add those two things together onto their fleece, it can add many tens of dollars onto the fleece value of, of each animal. So yes, multiply that by a few thousand sheep, the sum's uh, pretty straightforward. It's a fair step from the labours of Matt's father, Tom Dunbabin, let alone those who went before him. Certainly when I look at what we're doing there now and what, what I did and what my son's doing now, he's cutting more wool of finer micron using modern breeding techniques and technologies um, and made sort of gains that I wouldn't have thought and certainly my father wouldn't have thought possible. The Dunbabins have made critical decisions about how this property is to be run. In the short term, the capacity to maintain the vision depends on wool prices. I think there's a pretty good future in fine wool. Obviously it's uh, tougher and tougher to make a dollar out of it, but I think if you keep improving the operation and if, as long as prices are semi-reasonable, we can go pretty well and, and the way the industry is now and, and prices are pretty good, then um, fine wool sheep are as, as profitable as, as any sheep at the moment. Matt Dunbabin sees a time when the story of how Bangor wool is produced becomes part of the way it's sold. There's tradition here, so we've been growing for a long time, and there's also the environment that we've got, so how we manage that environment. So the story is in the way that the sheep are run and the place that they're run to end up with the product that we get. There might be easier properties to manage than Bangor. Excluding stock and conserving country certainly takes time and money. But whatever the weather, and the weather can be decidedly mixed, Bangor has its charms.
as well as fresh challenges for generations to come.